today. And the day before, we talked about the chi-square goodness of fit test. So that was a test for comparing the distribution of one categorical variable from one sample. That was the key piece there. So we used the observed counts from a sample, and we compared it to the expected counts based on a claim distribution. And if they were different, we would say that the initial distribution was incorrect or the stated claim was wrong. If we didn't find any convincing evidence, we'd say that there was no evidence to say that it wasn't wrong. Okay? So that was kind of our goal with that, our goodness of fit test. Well, today, we're going to talk about a second type of chi-squared test called the chi-squared test of homogeneity. Now, what we're doing here is essentially an expansion of our two sample Z procedures. So in chapter 10, when we looked at the differences of two proportions, so how did one proportion compare to the other? We were able to run a two-prop Z test, find our p-value, and determine if there was a difference in the true proportions or if there was no difference between the two proportions. What we're going to be doing with this test is expanding that to multiple groups. So the, the two-prop Z test only works when we have two samples. We only have two groups that we're comparing to, or to each other. In this case, we want to compare more than two samples or groups. So we want to look at maybe three or four possible groups at a time. Okay? So we want to compare the distributions of a single <laughs> categorical variable across several populations or treatments. Okay? So the test that compares the distribution of counts for two or more groups on the same categorical variable is called a chi-square test of homogeneity. So the key piece is here. Two or more groups are being analyzed and all of those groups are being measured on the same categorical variable. So when you want to run your chi-square test for homogeneity, you have to verify that you have multiple groups that are being measured on the exact same categorical variable. So there's only one variable in question. We're measuring that variable on multiple groups of people or items. So I'm okay with that idea. That's going to be very important that you understand exactly what that means because that is the number one difference between the test we run today, the test we run tomorrow, and the test we ran yesterday. So it's multiple groups being compared over the same categorical variable. So two or more groups, one single variable being measured. Now, this test asks or determines whether choices are the same among the, the different groups or the different treatments. So we can do this using sampling or we can do this using experiments. So if we're sampling, we would be creating different groups of people for our sample. If we were running an experiment, we'd be looking at the differences among the treatments. But what we're initially or what we're overall looking at is whether the distribution for that one single variable is the same among all of the groups that we're studying. So in essence, it's like taking that goodness of fit test. The goodness of fit test said for one sample, we look and see if the distribution we find matches the claimed distribution from the percentage. What we're doing with the chi-square test of homogeneity is we're now looking at multiple samples at a time. So from one sample to the other sample to the next sample, are those distributions the same? So we're not comparing to a base distribution. There's not a claim distribution that we have to match up to. It's here's a distribution for group one, here's a distribution for group two, here's a distribution for group three, or however many we have. And are those distributions all the same? Are all the same choices being made regardless of the group or the treatment or what we're <coughs> Are we okay with that idea? 
So we're going to kind of run through this example. We'll talk about how to set up a part of it. Then we'll go back to the example, show what it looks like, and so on. So we're going to kind of be jumping back and forth between example and concept here. So market researchers suspect that background music may affect the mood and buying behavior of customers. One study in a Mediterranean restaurant compared three randomly assigned treatments. So no music, French accordion music, and Italian string music. Under each condition, the researchers recorded the number of customers who ordered French, Italian, and other entrees. So when we look at this problem, and when you're doing a problem like this in your homework or on a quiz or a test, the first thing you have to establish is what type of test would I be running? So in this case, are we trying to match a sample distribution to a claimed distribution? No, there's no stated distribution that we have to match up to, so it's not goodness of fit. So the next thing we have to look at, the only other test we know is this homogeneity test. So we have to look, are we looking at multiple groups of people? Yes. Are they being measured on one single variable? Yes, they are. So now here's the key. Which piece is the groups? Which piece is the variable? Because in this two-way table, I have two different items that look very similar. Music is the... The treatment. So there are three separate treatments. Those are going to be our groups. There are people that listen to no music. There's a sample of people that listen to French music. And there's a sample of people that listen to Italian. So the music is the treatment being applied, which means these are our three groups. So those are our multiple groups. The one variable we're measuring is the entrees they ordered. So what type of entree did they order? So one of the things that you're going to notice, and especially tomorrow when we introduce the test of independence, they're set up in the exact same two-way table, but they're two completely different ideas. So it's important that you recognize that the music creates three separate groups of individuals. And then the one variable that we're measuring is the type of entree that they ordered. Can everybody see that? So that's going to be the most important part. And even today, when all you're working with is this test of homogeneity, it can sometimes be a little tricky as to which is separating into the groups and which is actually the variable being measured. So you want to make sure you can make the distinction between that so you're setting everything up correctly. So are we okay with this idea? All right. So the hypotheses when we want, want to run a test for homogeneity. So after we examine the scenario, we decided this is going to be a chi-squared test of homogeneity. So we need to write our hypotheses. Now these are generic. This is like a blanket statement you can use. And then we'll show how to actually apply it specifically to the context of the question we're dealing with. So the null hypothesis, a blanket statement you can use, is that there is no difference in the distribution of, and then insert the categorical variable you're measuring. So there is no difference in the distribution of whatever variable you're measuring. So this is very similar to our test for two proportions. When we ran our two proportion Z test, our null hypothesis was that P1 minus P2 equals zero. We hypothesized that there was no difference between the two proportions. So it's the same idea here, it's just now we have multiple groups to account for. So our null hypothesis is that there's no difference in the distribution for the categorical variable. Which means the alternative would be there is a difference in the distribution of whatever categorical variable. So we always start by assuming that there's no difference in the groups. If we find <coughs> enough evidence, we can actually reject that claim and conclude that there is a difference somewhere among the groups. So when we look at our problem here, we said that the different groups were the no music, the French accordion music, and the Italian string music. The variable of interest was the type of entree ordered 
during the meal. So if we were to apply these statements here, our null hypothesis should be what? So there's no difference in the distribution of type of food ordered based on the kind of music being played, right? So it can be something as simple as that. Now, the way I worded it was more with the, the uh, wording of the statements, but you can do it a little bit differently. So the context part, the variable part, you can kind of put in as long as it gets a point across which variable you're actually looking at. So the way I wrote it out is there's no difference in the distribution of entrees ordered at this restaurant when no music, French accordion music, or Italian string music is played. You could shorten that because you don't have to list out all three groups. You could say there's no difference in the distribution of entrees ordered at this restaurant based on music choice. Okay, so something like that would work just fine. They don't care that. And so then for our alternative hypothesis, we would simply say there is a difference in the distribution of, and then just copy down the exact same thing. So whatever you start or whatever your context you put into your null hypothesis, it's the exact same thing for your alternative. The only difference is here's no difference, here is a difference. Make sense? All right. So chi-square tests are all about comparing counts. So just like with the goodness of fit test, we had a set of observed counts, and then we had a set of expected counts that we had to calculate. We <coughs> compared the expected to the observed. The same process is going to happen with a test for homogeneity, but we calculate things a little bit differently. With the goodness of fit test, we had a claimed distribution. We had a set value for our percentages. So we took our sample size times the different percentages for each category, and that gave us our expected counts. In this case, our data is organized a little bit differently. So when we want to calculate expected counts for a test of homogeneity, in our two-way table, we're going to have some row totals and column totals. So if I want the expected count for one individual cell in my two-way table, I take the row, or the row total for that cell times the column total for that cell and then divide by the overall total. So let's take a look at what that looks like with our problem here. So in our two-way table, we have nine different cells, nine different possible combinations of treatments and groups. So there's no music ordering French, no music ordering Italian, no music ordering other. French, or listening to French and ordering French, listening to French, ordering Italian, and so on. So we have nine different cells. When we talk about cells within a two-way table, we exclude any totals. So our row totals and column totals are not included when we talk about how many cells are in our two-way table. It's only the pieces that are combinations of the variable and groups. Is everyone okay with that? So our row totals are the totals for each row. So the total number of people who ordered French was 99. The total number of people who ordered Italian was 31, and so on. Column totals, then, are the totals for each column. So 84 people had no music while they ordered food. 75 people had no or French music while they ordered food, and so on. So if I wanted the expected count for no music but ordered French, I would take the row total. So they ordered French. 99, column total for none, 84, I'd multiply those together and divide by the 243. So my calculation would look something like this. So the expected number of people who would order French food while listening to no music, on average, would be about 34.22 based on the result of the entire study. So, using the same idea, if I wanted to find the expected number of people who ordered Italian while listening to French, so if I wanted the expected number for that specific cell, what would I do? Take 
take 31 times 75 and divide by 243. Okay with that? If we wanted the expected count for uh, someone who ordered other while listening to uh, none, so while listening to no music, we would do what? Yeah, so 113 times 84 divided by 243. So whichever specific cell you want, you just follow it out to its row total, follow it down to its column total, multiply those, divide by the overall total. Okay with that idea? All right. So that's going to be how we calculate or uh, create our expected counts. So here are the observed accounts, which would be given to you. Our expected counts, we go cell by cell. What is each expected cell or expected <coughs> count for each of those different pieces? So the next thing, in order to actually run the test, we need to check conditions. Now, if you notice, these conditions are exactly the same as the conditions for goodness of fit. Exactly the same. The chi squared test is run the same way, so it has the same conditions. So the data comes from a random sample or from a randomized experiment. The 10%, if we're sampling, we cannot be more than 10% of our population. <coughs> if we're experimenting, we do not need the 10%. And then for large counts, all expected counts must be greater than or equal to 5. So if we looked at each of the individual cells and we calculated their in, or expected counts, none of them can be less than 5. So if we look at our example here, our random condition, we know it's random because we're talking about a randomized experiment. Since it's an experiment, we don't necessarily need the 10% condition. Now, for large counts, this shortcut that I'm going to show you here is a way to kind of save yourself some time because if we think about this, depending on our two-way table, if we had four groups with a variable in three categories, I would have how many different cells? I'd have 12 different cells. I'd have to calculate 12 different expected values using that formula over and over and over again, right? But what we can think about is the fact that within those cells, one of them has to be the smallest. So one of those cells has to be the smallest number if we're not uniformly distributed. So in that case, the way to identify the smallest count so the smallest possible expected count, if we think about how it's calculated, it's row total times column total divided by overall total. So if I can find my smallest row total and my smallest column total, that product will be less than any other product I could possibly put together. And since I'm dividing by the same number regardless, that's going to give me my lowest expected cell count. So if we look at our chart here, what's the lowest row total? <coughs> the 31, it's going to be the Italian food. So 31, what's my lowest column? 75. So if I take those two values and multiply them, that's going to be the smallest product I can get in my calculations. So if I multiply those together and divide by the 243, that's going to be my smallest expected count, which means no matter what else I do, all the other counts have to be larger. So if this one is larger than 5, all of them have to be larger than 5. I don't have to check all 9 to make that condition work. Is everyone okay with that? Now, on a problem like this, there are times where, like, and for instance, these two columns have the same number. So let's say the French column actually had like 96. Well, in that case, I have two column totals that are my lowest. So what would I do? Pick one of them. If they're the same, it's going to be the same either way. So that would mean my none ordering Italian would be the same expected count as my Italian listening to Italian. Right? So if it's a tie within the column or row totals, just pick one of them and use it. Because the other one's going to be the exact same either way. So 
going back to what we were looking at here, when we calculate that smallest expected cell frequency, it's going to be 9.57, which is larger than 5. So all of my expected counts have to be larger than 5, because that was going to be my or smallest possible. We okay with that idea? All right. So, as far as the calculations are concerned, we calculate our chi-square statistic exactly <laughs> as we did for the goodness of fit test. So we had a set of observed counts, we had a set of expected counts, we took observed minus expected, squared <laughs> it, divided by expected. So when we want to calculate our chi-square statistic test, or our chi-square statistic, we do the exact same formula. Observed minus expected squared divided by expected. This time, we're going cell by cell. We're not including the totals. So the totals are never included in the overall calculations here. So for our problem, here was our observed counts. This was given to us in the problem. This would be something we could calculate using the formula for expected counts. So what we end up doing is going cell by cell, matching them up. So if I take the observed minus expected, so for none with French, I would take 30 minus 34.22, that difference squared, divided by 34.22. And then we go to 39 with 30.56 and so on. Uh, usually the biggest is either 4 by 3, 4 by 4, maybe, like there might be a 5 in there some, or so on. Excuse me, please. Yes. Yes? May I have Kylie Swires to the health office right now, please? Uh, can she finish the test first? I will let them know. How long will that be about? Uh, probably 20 minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll see what she says. Thank you. Can I go that? All right. So, when we're going through this process, this is what it looks like. Okay. Now, as far as calculating the statistic goes, then we would go, like I said, cell by cell, calculate it all the way out. So, 30 minus 34.22, that quantity squared, divided by 34.22, and then 39, and so on. So we just go cell by cell. At the end, we get our chi-square statistic of 18.28 in this case. So once we have our chi-square statistic, what do we do? Plug it into your calculator. So the distribution we choose is the chi-square CDF. Okay. So we start with our chi-square CDF. Now, the main thing I want you to get off of this slide is the degrees of freedom. <coughs> Chi-square distributions are dependent on degrees of freedom. Since we have multiple rows and columns, we can't simply take the number of categories minus one here. So when we do our chi-square CDF, it's going to ask for the chi-square value first. That's your lower bound. 1e to the 99 is always your upper bound because we always measure to the right. And then we need our degrees of freedom. To calculate degrees of freedom, you take the number of rows minus one, times the number of columns, minus one. Rows and columns do not include the totals. So do not include the totals as part of your row and column calculation. So in our example, we had three rows. They listened to, or they ordered French, Italian, or other. We had three columns. They listened to no music, French music, or Italian music. So we have three by three for our cell count. So for this particular case, we would take the three minus one times the three minus one, we get four degrees of freedom. Do we ever include totals for anything? Only in the, the totals only come into play for the expected cell counts. Other than that, you ignore them. The CDF yesterday too. Yes, always CDF. Yeah. Yep. The PDF, I don't, I have never seen a use for it, so I don't even know exactly what that tells. I think it just gives you a point distribution, but I, CDF is always the way to go. So, once we do that, what does that point 001 represent? 
our p-value, which is the ultimate goal of any of our tests. So our p-value is 0 0.001. What does that mean? Yeah, so if we, if we wanted to interpret it, we'd say if the null is true, this is the probability that we would get a distance this big or bigger. <laughs> but if we're looking at how we're going to reject or fail to reject, 0 0.001 would lead us to reject. Just about any alpha we would choose, we're going to be less than that alpha level. Okay, So 0 0.001 is less than alpha. Since we didn't specify an alpha, we would use 0 0.05 by default. So here's what our conclusion would look like for our scenario. Since P is less than alpha, we reject the null. So that's the first part of every conclusion is what are we doing? What's our decision? And then we have to put it into context. So we have convincing evidence of a difference in the distributions of entrees ordered at this restaurant based on music type. So the null is that there's no difference in the distribution. The alternative is that there is a difference. And remember our conclusions always based on the alternative. So we found convincing evidence of a difference in the distributions of entrees ordered at this restaurant based on music type. Now, you wouldn't have to necessarily put this into your conclusion, but in this specific scenario, because it was a, an experiment that was run, Experiments allow us to apply or imply causation. So because this was an experiment and we found a difference between the distributions, we can say that the differences was, were, were caused by the music that's played. So we've shown that based on the type of music played, you will get different orders at that particular restaurant. Okay with that? All right, now, for this type of problem, so I think that's, that's the end of that one. So you can get these copied down here real quick. And then I want to talk to you about how to do this in the calculator. Wait, was there a calculator way for the last one? Did we have to go over that? There is, and we'll go over that. That's what I think you said. 